Hi everyone, my name's Tom and this is Quick Watercolour Birds. So in this episode we are going to be looking at one of the most recognisable and loved seabirds, certainly here in the UK at least. So let's roll the intro and get into it. The bird we're talking about is of course the Atlantic Puffin. Amazing and surprisingly small little birds. They are also known as the sea parrot because of that stunning beak that appears in the breeding season. They nest in burrows, they fly underwater to catch sand eels, and then they disappear into the vastness of the ocean over the winter. These birds are not only fascinating, but they are also a fantastic painting subject. We have the stunning contrast of the white front and the black back, and we also have all of that fun to be had with white in shadow, which we've seen before, but we also have black in sunlight, which is also an opportunity to have a bit of a play with the paint. The shapes of the faces are just wonderful too, and to top it all off, we know that we have the most amazing shots of red, orange, yellow and blue, not only in the beak but also appearing in the face too. So the balance here is between large abstract washes of light and dark for the body along with the more controlled approach to tackling the face. So this is going to be a really fun one. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to stay up to date with all the future videos and you can also see another full length painting of a pair of puffins exclusively on my Patreon channel. Uh, it's also fully narrated, the link is in the description below and there are also shorter time lapses available at some of the lower tiers. So this subject was taken from a suggestion from someone in the comments of the last video and there are also two other suggestions that I will be getting to in the next two videos. So is there a bird that you would like to see me paint? Please pop your answers into the comments. So that's it, let's take a quick look at the drawing and then we're going to dive into the painting. So as with many birds, the initial stages are fairly straightforward. They're all about just laying in those big shapes first. We've got a kind of big oval or even egg shape for the body. Slightly higher up than some birds, we've then got a fairly obvious round shape for just the head or you could look at an egg shape for the head and the beak, whichever suits you best. And then we kind of connect that with the neck. The idea here is that the shapes don't perfectly represent what we're looking at, but they represent the framework of everything correctly proportioned and correctly angled. And then we kind of chisel and chip away at that with our pencil. We maybe rub bits out until we refine the smaller shapes within those bigger shapes, as well as sticking other bits on top of that, almost like we're sculpting. And one of the big things here is to look for the negative shape between the beak, the front of the neck and the chest, and also checking that overall kind of outline shape on the back for a nice kind of sweeping effect and kind of almost like an S shape through the bird. The main thing as always is the proportion of those shapes in relation to each other. So how long is that neck relative to the head? How long is the head and the neck together relative to the chest and the body until we get to the feet? Little markers like this. How wide is the face relative to the width of the beak? and of course the overall angle of those big shapes. Once we've got all of those general things in place, then as always we can decorate it with the little hits of information and detail that are the eyes, little shapes within the beak which are quite important, and also I've just put in a few gentle marks just to denote that I might want to chuck some sea thrift in there just to make a bit more of a setting for the bird. And that's basically it, keep it really simple, big to small shapes, let's get into it. So for the colours we have thalo blue, really strong, very turquoisey blue, but when mixed with the red, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, we're going to get those really beautiful rich darks. I've also got an ultramarine blue, which as we know is that much softer, more purpley blue. It's perfect for the white in shadow in this particular bird and also add a bit of a purpley hue to some of the other areas as well as in the beak. Then the red that I'm going to use is a very, very orangey red, which is pyrrole red, lovely warm red. You could use vermilion, naphthol, or even cadmium red. I've also got a bright yellow orange, which is a really beautiful colour. It's a convenience colour. We could mix orange, but it's a lovely kind of bright yellowy orange, as the name suggests. And then very finally, the yellow I'm using is new gamboge. And just because it's on my palette, a little bit of hooker's green creeps in to some of the foliage, the sea thrift. And also just to get that sea thrift, kind of much more pinky red I also use quinacridone red so it's quite a broad palette here and I'll talk much more about the color as we go okay so here we go the almost blank page sort of part excitement part nervousness part not having any idea where to start so we though are going to start with just pure ultramarine 
fairly wet consistency. I should just mention that this is at um, one and a half speed. The idea is that it takes like a 45, 50 minute painting and I think just makes it a little bit more palatable, <laughs> no pun intended, or a bit more digestible and easy to watch, but you still get all the brush strokes. It's not too sped up, I don't think. So I'd be interested to see what you guys say. I can always make it a slightly slower version, but still sped up. But we're starting with Ultramarine here and I'm just laying in the shadow side of the white of the face. And then this is probably like kind of milky coffee consistency. And then I take the top square of the palette. It's just got a bit more of the quinacridone red in and a bit more of the blue and it just gives us a slightly more purple color. But this first bit is just kind of laying in the foundations. Um, we obviously need to let lots of whites of the page show through, especially on the face, but we also want to give that feeling of a rounded face, which I'll come back to in a sec. And then this is more kind of single cream consistency paint, and it's much more of the quinacridone red in there, um, which is obviously pushing towards purple at the moment, which is fine because that is going to represent the black feathers, but getting hit by sunlight. So they do have like a warmish kind of purpley tinge to them. And the idea here is we start very light we start very loose, we start very wet, we let all of those colours flow together. We're still after kind of simple um, yet accurate shapes with the brush and generally we're not going any thicker than maybe kind of single cream consistency. And then down here we've got again white in shadow. So I'm just kind of linking all of that together because I want some soft edges where the bird is in shadow, so where the white face meets the black of the the kind of the back and the neck and where the white feathers in shadow on the kind of underside and the belly meet the the darker feathers on the wings and the back. I want a soft transition between them. I don't want it to be so soft that we can't see it at all, but I want it to be soft enough that it gives like a gentle transition. And then I tried to inject a bit of warmth into the underside here. The orange didn't really work because it kind of muddied with the blue. Uh, and created a grey but the, the kind of more pinky purple colour works and at the moment it looks to be more intense than the than the black feathers but as we bring in the black feathers that will begin to make more sense. So what I'm doing here is looking for an abstract shape of light to create the form of the bird and trap the light on the chest uh, and then I purposely soften a few edges between the shadow and the light area and then now we're going to very, very thick, buttery, almost kind of marmite consistency of paint straight away. So this is the thalo blue mixed with the orangey red, which gives us a very rich dark. And I'm gonna talk about mixing darks in the quick tip section. And this is all about timing. So I'm going into the dark feathers here. Like I said, I want that soft transition between the dark feathers and the shadow side of the face. But if I went in any earlier, the paint that I'm putting in would shoot into the face and we wouldn't keep the definition. If I went in any later it just wouldn't be soft enough so it's that kind of balance between soft and hard. So the paint that I'm working into is a kind of moist consistency. It's not really wet but it's also not quite dry and therefore we get lovely soft transitions but at the same time the paint kind of as good as stays where I put it when it's got this consistency of kind of marmite, that sort of thing. And then if we imagine the face as a ball, we know that when we have a ball lit from above on one side, we also get a core shadow and this becomes incredibly apparent on a puffin. You always get this little line of slightly darker shadow um, in the face and then it gets slightly lighter again just before it meets the dark feathers and that gives a real illusion of form and shape and roundedness. So I did that by just dropping in kind of double cream consistency of paint into the drying kind of moist wash of the face. So I'm about to release a, um, a watercolor bites video where I talk a lot more about paint consistency, but it's something I'm always going on about because aside from all the usual foundational principles of, of any painting, any subject, any medium, um, <clears throat> one of the big, big things in watercolor is understanding how much pigment and how much water is in your brush or in your mixture. 
and at what stage of drying the paint is on the page. If you can get your head around those two things, your watercolour painting will um, drastically improve or, yeah. So we're into kind of the sea thrift here. So <clears throat> pure quinacridone red, which is that beautiful pink kind of magenta -y colour. And then I've noticed that with just a little bit of that bright yellow orange into the magenta, it can just kind of lift it a little bit. And I'm kind of knocking those in where I might, and trying to keep it random basically, which is easier said than done because we tend to create patterns, but with a bit of splatting of paint, a bit of kind of just letting the brush do whatever it wants. And then going in with the, um, the new Gamboge yellow, a little bit of that hooker's green to create a lovely bright green. And then kind of just in a very loose way and trying to keep the marks very natural. Um, kind of hit the bottom of some of the sea thrift flowers and then bring it down to create some illusion of stalks and not being afraid to let the shadow of the puffin just run into the green, run into the orange. It doesn't really matter too much. That's that kind of abstract nature to the painting that I'm talking about, which will contrast so nicely with the, the further details in the face. And this is kind of start with kind of coffee and single cream consistency. And then when, when I want the paint to kind of stay a bit more where I put it, that's when we go back to the slightly thicker consistency. So I've mixed a really, really strong Marmite consistency of paint here for a really rich dark. Again, it's the thalo blue and the orangey pyrrole red, and that gives me a rich, deep dark. And just before that dries, very final few marks just to sharpen up and push in the dark accents. I just hit a few other places and again the, the edges of these marks will soften ever so slightly into the almost dry paint but they won't disappear completely and then we get a slightly warmer um, kind of color where where the black f um, feathers move into sunlight there in this particular one they're generally getting that kind of slightly pinky purpley sheen to them um, and it's up to you how far you push that. Mine have stayed quite kind of bluey purple on the back and then they kind of drift into a purpley colour as they meet the chest and then I'm going to try and create something similar on the head but in some ways more importantly than the colour is just that the fact that it actually just gets warmer and it gets lighter as we transition from the dark into the light and that's the biggest thing and I've spoken about it before and I'll speak about it again many times is with the colour mixing it doesn't always have to be the perfect colour we more need to ask the question of, as I move from this area to that area, does it get lighter or darker or does it get, and does it get cooler or warmer or does it get more pinky, more orangey, that sort of thing. So as we go from the dark in the feathers and we move around the form of the bird into the light areas, it not only gets lighter, it also gets warmer. Sometimes that warmer is simply a warmer blue other times it really pushes towards like a much more pinky purpley color and beyond that we get into the magentas and even the oranges so just that those two simple questions as I go from A to B on my subject and on my painting does it get lighter or darker does it get cooler or warmer or does it get more pinky more orangey more bluey those sorts of questions hue based so now everything's blocked in. You can see now the paint has dried really nicely on the face. I've got that illusion of form. I've not been afraid to have some sharp transitions between the white of the page and the blue ultramarine in the face, but I've also purposely had some softer transitions. So all the time, soft and hard edges playing with those. Sometimes it's a soft edge between two shadow colors. Other times you're softening an edge between a shadow color and a light color. But if you soften everything, it can all be a little bit too soft. And if you keep everything too hard and sharp, that can also be a bit too much as well. So I dive in here with a very light kind of orangey new gamboge color and the front part of the beak. And I'm kind of just laying in the basic foundations here. The hardest thing about this is timing it right, because if I take that color um, and I accidentally hit some of the darker blue, it's going to muddy this lovely red color that I'm putting in. Equally, the kind of blue triangle that you get in the beak of the puffin. Um, I don't want that to run into the orange because they're complementary. They'll cancel each other out and create gray. And nothing wrong with that, but in this particular one, the whole point of this is we want really bright, punchy colors in the face. So if I start having too much of that blue going into the orange, it's going to have the opposite effect. We're going to have more dull colors. 
So I'm just mapping out the very basic uh, shape of the bird. We're going a little bit darker on the bottom, kind of the bottom part of the beak, the bottom half of the beak. And then just sharpening up a few marks. And this is again, it's kind of single cream consistency. So the, the paint is flowing together a little bit, but at the same time, it's kind of reasonably controllable as much as watercolor ever is. Then this is the quinacridone with a little bit of pie roll, very neat paint, probably like Marmite with a little bit of dumble cream kind of consistency. And just while it's wet, I'm just striking in very softly a few little darks or darker tones, I should say. And what I want to do is kind of push the, the lower part of the beak slightly darker and attempt to at least keep some of the top half of the beak just a little bit lighter. And we're kind of homing in on um, this first kind of block in stage being done. I just want to block in the eye uh, just a touch more. And then we'll take a quick break to look at the quick tips, which is going to be how to mix really rich, deep darks, because it's such an important thing in watercolor. And there's a few little quick tips and tricks for that. So here I'm just taking the very orangey pie roll with a little bit of orange in there. And basically we get this lovely red around the eyes of the puffin. And what I'm doing here is laying in the red further than it needs to be keeping it nice and light and then we're kind of going to let that dry off and then paint the blue around it because again if we paint the blue too quickly around the orange the blue will shoot into the orange and it will muddy it all and just in the face at least and the beak like I said I want to keep these these colors very clear and very separate and that will then contrast with the much softer areas where everything kind of flows together yeah so we're, we're essentially there with the block and I can't do much more on the beak because that area needs to dry for me to work any more into it safely and I can't do any more on the eye at the moment um, without kind of it causing any problem so last little touch which I might as well stick in now is a nice bright kind of yellowy orange just for that funny little um, kind of marking we get on the corner of the puffin's beak just there and again I'm laying it in light so that I can go back to it later put in a bit of dark so that's it for now we're going to come back and home in on the head much much more but just for a sec we're going to go and look at those quick tips okay guys so in this quick tips video we're going to talk about creating nice rich darks it seems especially relevant for the puffin uh, but obviously in most paintings we want at least some really rich dark and there's various ways to do this obviously one of the easiest ones is to just have a black so black is great uh, it's your shortest route to a nice deep dark you can drop other colors into it but quite often our black can be a little bit flat um, and it can just be more fun and interesting to mix our own deep darks using actual colors because they just look a little better to my eye anyway and also if we just add a little bit of water to lighten them they tend to be much more exciting than just a dull gray so let's have a look at them so one of the main things about mixing a black is you're going to need an existing dark color our easiest dark colors are our blues and something like prussian blue ultramarine blue or thalo blue are all very deep dark blues already they're not as dark as you can go but they're already a long way there so that's a good place to start one of the easiest ways to do a deep dark is to mix your ultramarine with some burnt sienna and they kind of cancel each other out the burnt sienna is very orangey the ultramarine is very obviously bluey so they're kind of um, opposite and they kind of cancel each other out and they give us a nice rich deep dark obviously a large part of creating a dark is that you need um, a lot of pigment and not much water, but that's kind of a, a side note. But obviously the more pigment we have and the less water, the darker it will go. So that gives us a really rich dark. You could also do the same with Thalo. The same principle kind of applies, just Thalo blue or Prussian blue gives us a nice rich dark. The Thalo is more intense and more strong, so it tends to dominate. So we might need a little bit more in there. Also the Burnt Sienna tends to turn the Thalo green if we're not careful and so we end up with more of a greeny dark so that takes a little bit more work the ultramarine and the burnt sienna is particularly good and then what you'll see as you kind of lighten it so let's just put a little bit of water in there you see that it's quite bluey so we might want to um, increase the level of brown in it and just change it but one of the reasons 
why I tend to not use this so much is one because it's just an extra color to have out and I don't really use burnt sienna that much secondly it can give some really beautiful soft grays but if we're not careful it can go to kind of a muddiness and it takes a kind of constant balancing to to kind of do that and what can be really great for these colored grays is to then drop other colors into it to make it more interesting but that's moving away from creating dark so let's go back to creating darks the other one is to create um, this doesn't really work with ultramarine blue but if we take something like phthalo blue uh, which is very very greeny and then we take a nice bright red so you could use pyrrole red permanent red cadmium red or vermilion red any very strong red uh, strong warm orangey red and it's completely opposing to the phthalo and so they cancel each other out and for me I generally use this as my rich dark uh, and look out what a rich deep dark that makes if it's coming out too blue you just add a tiny bit more red in there to cancel out the blueness and make a very neutral deep dark and that is how I get really deep darks if I then want a really solid dark we don't have any water it's just phthalo blue and an orangey red a little bit more red to cancel out the blue give it a good thorough mix and you'll get a really rich deep dark great for kind of dry brush work as well dry brush darks um, if it's too blue you add more red if it's too red you add more blue ultramarine and that red because ultramarine is a slightly lighter color they don't go as dark and also ultramarine is already slightly more ready so you tend to get a more dark purple color you won't get a deep rich dark you again if you use phthalo blue with a cool red you may get something similar but again it tends to push it to more towards like a, a darkish purple than a really dark then your other best option um, something I want to talk about very briefly there's no problem with using an opaque color to create dark if you use more than one opaque color when you're trying to mix a deep dark your colors start to go kind of muddy gray the opaque colors don't really want to go dark whereas the transparent colors really love going dark so just be aware of that not too many opaque colors or not more than one opaque color in your dark mix and then very finally uh, our other one is to mix a little bit of each of the primaries oops we we'll take some ultramarine take some ultramarine from there gonna take a little bit of new gamboge and we're gonna turn it to a green with the ultramarine and then we're going to mix in a bit of that warm red and again you kind of get a nice neutral dark because essentially what's happening it's the same as just needs more pigment that's why it's not dark enough too much water in there so lots of lots of ultramarine almost neat a little bit of red and we get a purple then the tiniest touch of the yellow to cancel out the purple and then we get nice deep rich darks so what's happening there is we're effectively simulating using prussian or thalo and red because the and the deep ultramarine with the red is creating like a very deep purple but to cancel out the purpliness and just push it a bit darker we're using a transparent yellow so that's a really great way to to mix darks so darks can be very simple and they can be much more exciting if you actually mix them with color rather than using black okay so here we go with the push towards the end of the painting we've got it all blocked in the only thing i haven't tackled is the blue in the face so hopefully you can see a little bit better while we're zoomed in and I'm going to try to remember to mix most of the colours in this kind of area that you can see really easily here so this is a little bit of ultramarine and a little bit of the phthalo with a dominance kind of towards the phthalo and what we get is this lovely little blue triangle um, just above the red of the eye I'm just going to work out whether to leave a little highlight there or to just knock out all of the white altogether but I think a little highlight just breaks up the bluer touch and it'll just help give it a bit more life and a bit more form and then we're going to go the same at the bottom so I don't really need to worry too much about any gradation of tone especially at this scale I just need kind of a dark blue and I use it to sculpt the red a little bit so that's why I laid in the red bigger than I needed it before and we use this dark blue to kind of sculpt underneath and then you might find that when you do something like that it looks a little bit hard and a little bit harsh so what I do here is just take initially 
a little bit of ultramarine and just kind of soften it into the dark blue I've just laid down and then we're using very very light watery ultramarine to kind of soften a couple of edges here um, and it can always look a bit sharp and a bit abrupt because it's probably going to be one of the sharpest smallest details on there when you first put it on but then as we build detail into the rest of the painting it will begin to make more sense and you can continue to soften it further or we can kind of leave it and kind of trust that it's going to look <laughs> fine once we get some of the harsher sharper details in the the eye was dead simple we just paint it all black leave a little white highlight at the white of the page and then just to give it a slightly more 3d look i tend to go in with a dry brush and just pull out some of the pigment if you do that too early on it will um, just backfill but if you do it while the paint is kind of a moist consistency that's the perfect time to um, to pull out pigment if you need to do that and then i'm just going in and softening a couple of the edges and that's really it for the eye you could do more you could um, sharpen up a couple of edges you could go in a little bit softer with some of the details i'll just go back in one last time with pure saturated dark and just hit the back edge of the blue triangle so i'm not outlining it i'm just going slightly darker and slightly heavier at the back edge of that triangle again and just just a, an attempt to give it a little bit of form and also a sense of like a light and a dark side and just to punch it up a bit so that our attention is really drawn to the eye it's, we've got a real sharpness of focus and sharpness of detail and smaller shapes and contrast of light and dark all in that eye so our our eyes are really drawn to it as the focal point and then here I really am just fiddling probably unnecessarily but you can see now the the bottom edge of the face where it meets the black of the feathers has got this beautiful softness to it that's what I was kind of after we've also got the granulation of the ultramarine and that's the eye done and now really I just go uh, on the side of lightness and this again is an ultramarine mixed with the thalo blue so they kind of the more purpley blue kind of takes the green edge off the uh, the thalo blue and the ultramarine doesn't dominate too much because the phthalo is kind of cancelling out so you could do it another way but that just seemed like an easy way to do it so I'm just laying in the blue shadow I've decided to leave a white line very fine of the white of the page on the front edge of the blue just again to create a, some sort of form and then just where the light is kind of catching the top edge of the bottom half of the um, of the beak just leave a little light there and it's just to break up solid washes um, always a good thing and then I'm going to go now with a very very dark consistency so this is kind of double cream consistency mostly thalo blue a little bit of ultramarine to balance it out and I just kind of drop it in there and I drop it in that bottom corner so we get a lovely gentle gradation um, just darken around the white highlight just to trap it a little bit more and just kind of punching up the details a little bit basically where can I sharpen up a line uh, and that that consistency of paint that kind of double cream or even buttery consistency of paint um, but not full-on marmite is great for kind of striking in sharp details and then all I'm doing here is just punching up that contrast um, around the center part of the beak so again we, we can take what appears to be quite complex and we can section it off into different areas and tackle those areas a little bit at a time um, and it takes some of the panic and the rush out of watercolour so now I'm going with a dry brush predominantly um, thalo and the pyrrole red with a bias towards the red because I want it to have a ready tinge to it um, and that kind of dry paint consistency and just striking on a couple of little details and it's amazing how just a few little hits of dry brush work and some darker tones over the top of our initial kind of lighter washes you know that's that is watercolor basically um, that's the kind of approach we're looking for and you can see that although that was one and a half times speed it really did not take a lot to get that in so a lot of this has come together very quickly um, there's really just like a few little extra details to look for I uh, just need to push some of the tones a little bit darker uh, especially in the underside of the beak and there's always like a little darker patch just under the corner of the mouth 
on the um, on the face of the puffin. So that's what I'm kind of doing here. Firstly, I want to glaze a slightly darker color into here just to give it a bit more form. Um, remember, I put the lighter color in first, and now I'm glazing in the darker color. We are going to use that just to sharpen up a couple of edges in the face because we know that we can get away with that in the face. Um, And then you can see everything kind of slows down a bit now. It's all very small marks just to bring it to a finish right at the end, like nice little sharp mark just at the top there. That's a very pure red. It's completely neat red paint because I just felt I'd not got enough of the really strong red into the painting, which is why I put a little bit on the bottom half of the of the beak and a little bit at the top here, just pure pyro red, just to, just to punch up the feeling of red a little bit. The orange is a great color. Um, but I just wanted to do that and then um, very neat pyro red just in the eye to again to punch it up it might not even make that much difference but it's worth trying it just to see if we can push it that little bit further and now we're going for that dark just under the corner of the mouth and it's kind of a lovely dark shape again it pushes the contrast further and then while I've got it there I wanted to mix a phthalo blue and a big dark red and while it's still wet I wanted to hit the darker the feathers into there so just we get a slightly softer mark or you know, slightly softer transition between the dark feathers into that darker kind of cast shadow so we've now got a stronger feeling of light um, because we've now got a stronger feeling of shadow so as we know with watercolor painting the shadows is what creates the light and we're always seeing how dark we can get away with pushing things we don't necessarily need to push everything to the absolute darkness in fact we don't want to do that but especially in the focal point especially in areas of high interest um, we certainly can push things darker so pushing the corner of the mouth a little bit darker now we don't have to do it but again it just pushes the form a little bit more pushes the contrast creates a bit more interest and we really are just absolute finishing touches here. There's, there's little hits here and there. I'm just trying to sort of resolve this area and get the paint to, in the shadows to flow together a little bit more because it's always a nice thing to do. Um, get those kind of soft shadow colors flowing together. And really I'm just trying to resolve it in a way that's pleasing. I'm just kind of keep playing with it without overworking it until it, um, until we get something that I like. So. Although I keep working an area, if you notice I'm not really working the paint, I'm not going in and scruffing the paint around, that would lift up the pigment underneath, it would force the pigment that you're painting with to not settle properly and you'd get that kind of muddy overworked look. But even though I'm working in small areas and appear to kind of almost be fussing about a little bit, it's still very immediate quick flicks of the brush, It's not um, we're not working the paint into the page too much. And pretty much the last thing that I wanted to do was just to glaze a stronger shadow on the underside of the beak. And you can see what a difference that makes straight away. Instantly by glazing the kind of the yellow part of the lower part of the beak into shadow, keeping the yellow on the top half of the beak light, we instantly create that pattern of light and shadow, which gives our feeling or stronger feeling of form. And then with a little signature in the bottom left corner, We've got it. There he is. Really fun one, came together really quickly. Big abstract areas mixed with some tighter areas in the face, keeping it really dead simple. Simple but accurate shapes and letting the paint do its thing as always. So there we go, an absolute blast to paint like this. It came out exactly as I was hoping with much more loose and abstract areas contrasting with the slightly tighter and more detailed face. And we also got those little injections of colour into the face and the beak. And then we balance those out with that beautiful pink sea thrift, which goes so well along with these little guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something too. If so, I would love to hear what some of your main takeaway points were. Please do drop them into the comments below. And please do feel free to ask questions or even make some requests for little topics you might want to see me cover in the quick tips sections. Until next time, guys, happy living, happy creating, and I will see you soon.